So uh, today, um, we're celebrating the Light of Truth Day. At the center, we have two holidays, or holy days, and one of them comes uh, here at the middle of August, and it comes at the end of our academic year, so to speak, just before our break. And the other one is on December 25th, and that's the Light of Love Day. And uh, we decided we're not Christians, so we don't celebrate uh, Christmas, uh, and uh, we're not any, uh, we don't belong to any traditional religion. We draw on the teachings of the mystics from all these traditions, including Christians, but we decided we would want our own uh, unique holiday, and we picked uh, December 25th because that's a day that our society you know, celebrates, and it's hard to avoid that Christmas fever. And, and we don't feel too bad about stealing it from the Christians because they stole it from the pagans, actually, <laughs> back in the third century. It's true. They, there was a pagan holiday, the uh, uh, Sun God Day or something, and they, the Christian bishops couldn't get their people to stay home. They went out and danced in the streets with the pagans. So they just said, oh, we'll make it uh, the, the birthday of Jesus. So they celebrate. So we're, we're, <laughs> we're learning a, a lesson from them anyway. So. Light of Truth Day. So why do we call it Light of Truth Day? Well, light is a metaphor for enlightenment used by mystics of all the traditions. Uh, here, for instance, is the great uh, Tibetan Buddhist Longchenpa. As the sun and moon uncovered by clouds, when the nature is freed from obstructions, it is called enlightenment. So light's built into enlightenment there. And the idea is just as when the uh, sun and the moon, which are luminous objects, when they are uncovered, when the clouds are dispersed, then the light just shines automatically. And that's the nature of enlightenment. Uh, here's the Christian mystic, St. John of the Cross. The divine light is never lacking to the soul, but because of creature forms and veils weighing on and covering it, the light is never infused. If individuals would eliminate these impediments and veils and live in pure nakedness and poverty of spirit, their soul in its simplicity and purity would then be immediately transformed into the simple and pure wisdom of God. So that's a very similar image, isn't it? There's some sort of veils covering uh, something here. And here's the 20th century Hindu mystic Ananda Moyama. Here's what she says. By chanting mantra, japa, meditation, and similar practices, one is cleaned and purified from the karma accumulated during countless former births and in the present. Thereby is aided the unveiled revelation of that blazing glorious reality, which like a radiant light shines deep within oneself and which is the goal. So again, and here's the Kabbalist scholar Gershom Sholem, the Kabbalist of the mystics of Judaism. Having climbed the seventh and last step of the mystical ladder and reached the summit, the mystic consciously perceives and becomes part of the world of divine light, whose radiance illuminates his thoughts and heals his heart. So you don't have to be a scholar to realize they're all talking about the same thing. This is, this is why we're here, the Center for Sacred Sciences. If you examine the teachings of the mystics, not the theologians, not the philosophers and all that, but the mystics from all these different traditions, all these different times and places, you find not only are they talking about the same thing, they're often use the same metaphors. Veils, for instance, some, we have a divine light in us, and it's, but it's veiled. And so uh, the, the path, the spiritual path from a mystic's point of view is about removing these impediments, these veils, these, uh, uncovering this divine light, which is already present. So, um, Ibn Arabi, who's a great Sufi, and the Sufis are mystics of Islam, he gives us a clue, an important clue, to the nature of this light. And here's what he says. The object of vision, which is the real, is light, while that through which the perceiver perceives the, him is light. Hence, light becomes included in light. It is as if it returns through the root from which it became manifest. So the light he's talking about here is the light of consciousness. Consciousness is the real. Consciousness is the nature of Allah in Sufism. 
And uh, the perceiver, that's us, when we perceive Allah, we're, it's our consciousness that perceives consciousness. So there's something about uh, an uh, important clue here because this mysterious talk about light and so forth can sound like woo-wee, but we're all familiar with consciousness. Uh, and normally we say we are conscious. I hope all of you here are conscious. If you're not, I, I can't help you. But if, if you are conscious, even though if you can't define consciousness or talk about it or whatever, at least you know what I'm talking about when I talk about consciousness. So it's something we all have, so to speak. And that is our laboratory. How do we get to know consciousness? How does consciousness get to know consciousness? This becomes the central problem on a mystical path, okay? So, <coughs> here's the... Um, uh, oh, the question then is, why don't we uh, see this light? Why aren't we enlightened if we're all conscious? And here's what the Christian mystic St. Bonaventure says. Here's how he explains it. Our mind, accustomed to the darkness of beings and the images of the things of sense, when it glimpses the light of the Supreme Being, seems to itself to see nothing. It does not realize that this very darkness is the supreme illumination of the mind. So the idea is here, uh, most of the time we're attending to all the objects, the creatures, the things arising, consciousness, our thoughts about them, our feelings and all. All these are forms or objects in consciousness. And we never attend to the consciousness which is perceiving them. And if we try to attend to the consciousness which is perceiving them, all we perceive is darkness, nothing. Because the consciousness which is perceiving the things is not itself a thing. So I look around, I look around, I keep seeing things, but I don't see the perceiver of the things. Here's, uh, uh, here's what uh, the uh, Sufi... Serno Bokar says, he describes three lights corresponding to three stages of the path, and the third light corresponds to the end of the path. And here's what he says. The third light is that, of, is that of the center of all existence, namely God. Who would dare to describe it? It is a darkness more brilliant than all lights combined. It is the light of truth. So, somehow this, this light is a darkness to our normal appearance. And so on a mystical path, to get to the light, or to see the light, we don't get to the light, we are the light, to see the light, somehow we have to penetrate darkness. We have to pass through this darkness. And here's, uh, uh, oh, and by the way, that's the title of my talk, The Darkness of Truth, even though we're celebrating the light of truth today, but my talk is The Darkness of Truth. And here's what uh, Dinius, the Arapagate, uh, says. He's a, uh, a Christian mystic. In the dil diligent exercise of mystical contemplation, leave behind the senses and the operations of the intellect, that thou mayest arise by unknowing towards the union with him who transcends all being and all knowledge. For by the unceasing and absolute renunciation of thyself and all things, Thou mayest be born on high into the superessential radiance of the divine darkness. But again, this is the, this play of dark and light, dark and light. Get to the light through the darkness. Another metaphor for this darkness is nothing, no thingness, because this consciousness, the perceiving consciousness, is not a thing. So here's uh, Gerson Sholem again, the, the Kabbalist scholar. Only when the soul has stripped itself of all limitation and in the mystical language has descended into the depths of nothing does it encounter the divine. Descended into the depths of nothing. And here's Ananda Moyama again. Where nothing is, there is everything. All efforts are for the sake of this realization. So, uh, this is a common, again, a common way of talking about this, uh, common to mystics of all traditions. It's not 
particularly Sufi, it's not particularly Christian or Buddhist or anything like that. Getting to the light through the darkness. And this is something that my teacher, Franklin Merrill Wolf, stumbled on after 25 years of searching, intense searching for a lot of the time. And I'm going to read you what he says about this because this was the final, as he says, key that opened the door of enlightenment. I'm going to read it to you and then uh, we're going to, I'll read it a couple times, so it's, it's quite long, so don't uh, get discouraged if you don't get it the first time around. We'll stop and talk about it. And then we're going to try it because that's the other thing about mystics, unlike other uh, religious believers. Practice is all important. The teachings guide you to practice, but the practice, you have to do the practices. So we're going to take uh, Dr. Wolf's instruction here, his, his description as an instruction, and we're going to try it ourselves and see what happens, okay? So I'm going to sit down for this one so I can uh, get the words better. And I think I can still do without the glasses. Let's try it. Here's what he says. I never found it possible to completely silence thought. So it occurred to me that success might be attained simply by a discriminative isolation of the subjective pole of consciousness with the focus of consciousness placed upon this aspect, but otherwise leaving the mental processes free to continue in their spontaneous functioning they, however, remaining in the periphery of the attentive consciousness. I further realized that subjective consciousness without an object must appear to the relative consciousness to have objects. Hence, recognition, and that's his term for enlightenment, recognition uh, did not of itself imply a new experience, uh, experiential content in consciousness. I saw that genuine recognition is simply a realization of nothing, but a nothing that is absolutely substantial and identical to the true self. That was the final turn of the key that opened the door. I found myself identical with voidness, darkness, silence, but realized them as utter though ineffable fullness in the sense of substantiality light in the sense of illumination, and sound in the sense of pure, formless meaning and value. <sighs> now, he discovered this on his own, I mean, you know, as he was practicing, but this is known to mystics of all the traditions. Again, here's how uh, the Persian Suvi, Baba Kui of Shiraz, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure about these pronunciations. See, I've never heard this name pronounced. I've only read it. Uh, I'd ask the Abdullah, but this is Persian. It's not even Arabic, so I don't think he can help me here. But anyway, here's what he says. When I looked into nothingness, I vanished, and lo, I was the all-living, only God I saw. When I looked into nothingness, and here's the contemporary Tibetan master, Sukhne Rinpoche. When the mind recognizes itself, there is no thing to see there. It is just wide open. All of a sudden, it's wide open. There is no thing at all. That's because the essence of mind is empty. It's wide open and free. So again, this is idea when you go look for the perceiver, when you go look for the self, when you go look for who you are, there's nothing there. This is what Dr. Wolf figured out before he went to look. But as he said, when he did this practice of isolating the subjective pole of consciousness and trying to ignore all the objects arising and trying to locate that nothingness, that darkness, ah, then he had the recognition. He discovered he was the ineffable, uh, the darkness, the nothingness that was the ineffable light. So, uh, I thought what we would do is I'll read his description again more slowly and we'll go over it. And then I thought we would try it, try to do what Dr. Wolf did right here. And then afterwards have a discussion and see what you found, what your experience was, okay? So, let me go through this. And if you have a question about something, uh, 
wave your hand. I'm blind on this side, so you guys on that side of the room have to wave vigorously. Uh, but uh, we can stop here. We don't have to rush through. Okay, he first says, I never found it possible to completely silence thought. Now, he's been meditating for many years and primarily doing uh, Hindu meditations. His, his guru was a, a Shankara who was, a, a, was already dead. He was a great teacher, like the seventh century in India. But they practice meditation, and a lot of Hindu meditation is about silencing thoughts, uh, stopping the modifications of the mind, as they call it. It comes from the Yoga Sutra. Is it this wolf you're talking about now? What's this? Is this Mr. Wolf you're talking about? Yes, now? I'm reading what his, his saying. So, so I never found it possible to completely silence thought. Any of you ever found it possible to completely silence thought? You have. Good for you, because if you can do it, that's a leg up on this. Because uh, thought is so distracting. Uh, but anyway, he never found it possible after 25 years. So it occurred to me that success might be attained simply by a discriminative isolation of the subjective pole of consciousness. A discriminative isolation of the subjective pole of consciousness. So here we are, we're all conscious. If any of you have uh, read, uh, what's his name, Harding? Uh, Douglas Harding, uh, his work, or seen any of his videos, he's got this exercise where you take a tube, uh, like, I don't know, a, a roll of, uh, from a paper towel, and you look through it, and you look out there, and it, it's very clear. You see all these objects out there. But when you try to look who's the looker, there's nothing there. So that's what we're doing here, trying to focus attention on the on that, who's the looker? The question, who's the eye? Who's the perceiver? Who's looking at all this? Who's hearing all this? Who's experiencing all this? Okay? So then, and so isolate that subjective pole of consciousness and then focus uh, the uh, consciousness placed on this aspect. But you otherwise leave the mental processes free to continue in their spontaneous functioning. They, however, remaining on the periphery of uh, attentive consciousness. So don't try to stop your thoughts. Don't try to control your thoughts or anything else. Whatever is arising, let it all just arise. It doesn't matter. Just ignore it. And t try to turn the light of consciousness back on its own source. In other words, uh, mystics put it that way, especially Hindu mystics. Then he says, further I realize that subjective consciousness without an object must appear to the relative consciousness to have objects. So here I am, I'm sitting here, and the subjective conscious, my consciousness, doesn't have any objects. It's not an object. If I'm seeing an object, I think, oh, that's my consciousness, you're, sunk, you're mistaken. Then you have to ask, well, who's seeing this object, this consciousness? Who's conscious of that? You're so always stepping back one. So, but right now, it looks like consciousness full of objects. So, it's not a question of changing any of this. This is perfectly fine. So it's not, it's not a question of any change of the content of consciousness. It's a change of the focus of consciousness. Hence, recognition did not of itself imply a new experiential content of consciousness. This, for me, this is really important because all my, um, during my path, I was always looking for something to change in experience. That I'd be sitting here and I'd read about these veils being lifted. And I'd think, oh, the veil's going to lift and I'm going to see these platonic archetypal forms or something. So there's going to be some change in, in my experience. And he's saying, no, there's no change is necessary in your experience whatsoever. The, the truth, the reality, as uh, we hear Ibn Arabi called, the real is the real all the time, no matter what's going on. It has nothing to do with what's going on. This is just fine. In fact, from an enlightened point of view, this is the Leela of God. This is a divine play. So it's not about trying to change any of that. So if you're waiting for something to happen experientially, you're waiting in vain. Well, things are going to happen. It's just, it's going to be more of the same, you know? <laughs> like Churchill said about history, it's just one damn thing after another. <laughs> and, so, but that's not going to lead to any recognition. That's just going to show you impermanence change, which is important to see. But there, you're not going to arrive. You are there. 
So forget about trying to arrive someplace. Okay, so now, let's, what else does he say here? I saw that genuine recognition, uh, recognition is simply a realization of nothing. Nothing. It's where uh, Ananda Moyamai said, where nothing is, there's everything. Simply a realization of nothing, but a nothing that is absolutely substantial and identical with the true self. The true self being the perceiver of all this. And then he says, this was the final turn of the key that opened the door. So he did this, you see, he did this focus. It wasn't just philosophy. He, he found the isolated, the subjective pole of consciousness and he looked and sure enough, there was nothing there and he kept looking at the nothing and boom, what happened? I found myself identical with the voidness, darkness, silence, all that nothing that he, he couldn't, there was nothing there, but he found he, that was him. That was it. That was the answer. But realize them as utter, though ineffable, fullness in the sense of substantiality, light in the sense of illumination, and sound in the sense of pure, formless meaning and value. Does anybody have any questions about? Okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a guided meditation. So don't worry about what he said. Now, so I'm just using his instruction. I'm boiling it down to, uh, breaking it down into an instruction. That hopefully you can follow and then we'll see what happens, okay? So uh, let's see here. We'll assume our meditative posture. Uh, just relaxed, upright, no, nothing special. And I ring the gong once to let us know we're beginning. This is just a way of focusing our attention and then twice to let us know when this exercise is all over. So that's the only formal part of it at all, okay? So uh, here we go. So why don't we just spend a few moments allowing our bodies and minds to relax. Now let's become aware of the objects arising in consciousness. And you might start by focusing attention on any bodily sensations that are present. Little tingles or tensions or pains. And then focus attention on any taste or smells that may be present. And then focus attention on any sights appearing in the visual field. Or if your eyes are closed, any spots or patches or whatever appearing in that, uh, against that velvety background.
and then focus attention on any sounds you might hear. The sound of my voice, any background buzzings in the room, maybe your own stomach gurgling. These are all objects in consciousness. And now focus attention on whatever thoughts or feelings are arising. Whether pleasant or unpleasant. Thoughts and feelings are also objects arising in consciousness. Now focus attention on any subtle energies that may be present, especially if you're a person sensitive to subtle energies. No matter how subtle energies are objects arising in consciousness. Now just generally rest attention on all these objects or whatever objects are arising in consciousness. And remember what Dr. Wolf said, recognition or enlightenment does not require any change of any of these contents in consciousness right now, just as they are. Now try to shift attention to the subjective pole of consciousness. That is to the perceiver, the consciousness that perceives these objects. To consciousness itself. And remember what Dr. Wolf said, this subjective pole of consciousness, the perceiver, is going to appear as nothing, no thing, darkness.
So what was your experience? Yes? Maybe I'm a little confused, but what's the subjective pull of consciousness again? The experiencer of everything. You, you hear my voice? Uh, I don't know quite how to answer that, but I mean, there, there are things, yeah, sure. Okay, <laughs> good. So who, who's hearing my voice? Or who or what is hearing my voice? That's, that's the subjective pole. My voice is the objective pole. It's an object, my voice, to you, right? So what's the subject? Who's experiencing it? Dr. Wolf was trained as a philosopher, so he picks his words very carefully. <laughs> uh, but it's not, it's not complicated. Okay. <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's very simple. It's not easy. There's a difference. It's, but it is very simple. Yeah. Well, but I guess what I would say is his question is, oh, is pointing at that, that from a woman's point of view, the subjective pole is the whole room, not her, not, so, so his question is, what are you referring to as the individual as opposed to the whole room? I'm sorry, from a woman's point of view? Well, for me as a woman, you know, I mean, but uh, that, that the subjective, or the, you know, these, these are just words, but the individual point of view, uh, of Mr. Wolf was just one person. That he's a self, he's like a toddler. He's a self-centered person. So he's, when he hears your voice, he doesn't recognize that it, the whole room is hearing the voice at the same time. He's not participating in the whole room hearing the voice. He's just doing it by himself. Well, I have no idea because he's not here to ask about that. I won't try to answer that. But what's your experience? Well, what I noticed, what I noticed in this yeah. event of yours is is I ended up bouncing back and forth between uh, that consciousness being the whole room from uh, coming out of hearing or receiving, or being the whole room being an initiator. Okay, so did you see the darkness, the nothingness? The, the darkness can show in both layers. Either one looks like darkness from the other viewpoint. Uh, it's two kinds of darkness. <laughs> okay. And so, and so what was the result for you of seeing that, that insight? Has it made any big difference in your life? Uh, well, I would, no, I wouldn't say it made a giant difference. Okay. <laughs> for, for Dr. Wolf, it turned his whole life around. For me, it turned my whole life around when I saw that. For these other mystics, it turned their whole lives around. So, it... it there's no guarantee that it's going to turn your life around, or you may not even be interested in having your life turned around and whatnot. So, but there's a, a, a clue here in terms of why did these people bother writing this recording? And why have they passed it on? Why have they passed on the practices and all that? So you may have seen exactly that. And it makes no difference to you. That's fine. But for other people, it's made a huge difference. So that's what we're trying to discover. Yes, Linda. Um, in the moment when you said to shift the attention, I, I experienced a, just a momentary brightening of all the colors and sharpness, but it, uh, it lasted just for an instant. That was the only thing. Uh, and when people wake up, sometimes they do experience a change of the content of consciousness. As, as gravy, you know, it's not, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's not required, it's not necessary. So it, it could be there was, you know, there was like you were touching in and that's a sign, I don't know. But uh, uh, my suggestion is keep looking. Yes. Um, kind of an open awareness, just, and, and I mean, there's no specifics to it anymore, it's just, <laughs> kind of an open awareness, and in that sense there's a nothingness because it's all <clears throat> one thing in a way. Mm -hmm. 
that's about. Well, when we stop focusing on one particular object, often you start to experience this kind of expanded consciousness, an open awareness, choiceless awareness, we call it, or awareness of awareness and so forth, which is great because we are usually, our, our attention is so conditioned to be locked into various patterns of experience that one of the reasons we do meditation is to break that conditioning down, to get attention to relax a little bit. So it's not always focused on just what I want, just what I don't want, and things like that. So uh, that's very helpful to be able to do that. But it doesn't sound to me like you saw the nothingness that was the, uh, <laughs> the uh, light that was full of substantiality and, and so forth. Probably not. Yes, Barb. I get confused about um, trying to do things. And so I, the moment I have uh, that space and I feel that darkness and I feel, then I find myself trying to see what it is. Yes. And, and so it comes and goes. Because then I try to relax and get to back to where I wasn't trying. Right. And that, that it doesn't confuse me, actually. It annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an excellent insight. It's a really excellent insight. It's the trying that disturbs it. The effort is the problem. And Ramana Maharshi actually had a great line said, your problem is the effort. And in a certain way, we are trying to become effortless. Well, that's that, again, that's, it's, it's very simple, but it's extremely difficult to really be effortless. So if it means anything to you, I would suggest the, the word surrender. When you touch into that darkness, that nothingness, that's the moment to just surrender. Now, you know, again, some people, then you try to surrender and you're, you know, you're caught on that thing. And the, the only thing you can do is just struggle until it happens. There isn't any trick. You're saying that to me because when I did Life Spring 30 or 40 years ago, my name was Surrenderella. <laughs> Great. Great. Yes, yes, in the back there. What happened to me is that I felt like my skin was starting to it would get really kind of prickly and then kind of like it was dissolving. And it felt like it would be good to let it dissolve, but then I kind of jump. Kind of like what you were saying, just like kind of a little fear. Oh. oh, 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 oh. Uh, very nice, very nice. Uh, I've told this story uh, recently uh, about Tsongkhapa, great, great Tibetan master. And he once was uh, teaching emptiness to a whole room full of students and who had heard about emptiness intellectually. You know, they study from the time they're kids, these uh, monastery kids. And he was giving a, an advanced teaching on emptiness and they were all sitting on their cushions. And one guy in the back went, oh! and Tsongkhapa looked and says, now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. From a teacher's point of view, it's a very good sign. It's a very good sign. Because that, that touching in, into true emptiness is there's nothing there. And there's, we have a, uh, a fear of nothing. We have a fear of losing self, of a no self. So that means you actually are actually touching into it. And I would uh, now back up what Wesley said. I would go see Tom Kurtzka. His whole path was encountering fear of no self. That was his whole path. So he's an expert in that. And you could go, and he, he takes questions, right? You go sit up and talk to him. So you could talk to him about that and see what he recommends. Yeah. Well, I wondered if uh, being warm could be, uh, seemed like I just started to try to, you know, focus in where it is and thought of you know, nothing, but then I felt warm. My whole body got warm. Uh -huh. I wondered if that was some kind of subtle energy, but it may have been something just to to distract me from doing it, I don't know. But. Well, again, it's just, it's more phenomena, objects arising in consciousness. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it, if, if you start focusing on that, that's taking your attention away from the subjective pole of consciousness, see? I just thought maybe I had to start all over because, okay, 
Okay, well, that's an object to my, my body feelings. You don't have to start over. You just have to let it go. Let it do what it wants to do. Your body wants to get warm, gets warm. Wants to get cold, gets cold. Now, well, the reason we do all this meditation practice is, is to try to not be distracted by objects, whatever they are. So, you know, jumping into this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of, we're, we're going to the, you know, the head of the uh, line here or something. Uh, remember, Dr. Wolf took 25 years doing all kinds of practices to get to this point. 25 years. So if you didn't get it today, don't be discouraged. <laughs> But there are important lessons to take away that you can save yourself a lot of time. If you're looking for change of phenomena, you, you'll find changes of phenomena, but that ain't it. That's not what we're looking for. So any even startling changes of phenomena, okay, they change, fine. Uh, forget it and go back to your meditation. When I was studying uh, meditation with a Tibetan master, uh, at one point, the, the visual field all just disappeared. It was like a, a camera lens, you know, closing and shh. And it was kind of stunning. Uh, nothing, you know, it didn't make me feel better or anything, but it was kind of uh, visually interesting. So I was anxious to report it to him. So I said, I told him what happened. He said, oh, he said, well, notice that and go back to your breath. We were doing breath meditation. So he wasn't impressed. <laughs> yes. Um, does, um the no thing, uh, if you feel that, that darkness, eliminate a sense of individuality, or is that even an, a factor? I mean, if you get into the darkness, is there any, is it like, oh, I feel the darkness, I'm in the darkness, or is there a sense of individuality in that feeling, or is it just a feeling darkness? Uh, don't feeling? don't worry about it. Anybody. <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, Pat. <laughs> No, this is not helpful to, at this point to talk about that kind of thing because we're looking for, we're not looking to try to figure this out, you know, intellectually. That's hard. Or not to, not figure, to, try to figure it No, there are times, there, there's certainly a time and place for figuring things out. But right now we're trying to look to have a direct, immediate insight, not figure it out. So you get distracted by trying to figure this out. True. So, yes. Um, Matt. I had a very difficult time separating the object from the subjective experience of the object, and I don't necessarily mean specific objects, just experiences a whole, something that's kind of out there. Um, the, the subjective seems to be completely interwoven with that experience, um, where it's difficult to, to draw some kind of boundary. Uh, it seems like the only way that I can even recognize any of the subjective experience that's happening is by having an objective experience. Uh, so to, to be able to say, like, focus in on that subjective quality, uh, it doesn't seem to be extricable from the totality of the, the binary. Okay, well, ultimately, you're right, there is no line, it's imaginary. But that, again, is not helpful at this point, because we're not worried about trying to figure out philosophically if it's imaginary or not. I can just say from my own experience, first of all, it is possible to have a subjective experience of consciousness without any objects. That was the moment of my waking up, actually. I was falling asleep. Did you read my book, Naked Through the Gate? Uh, not that much. Okay. Uh, anyway, I, I describe it in there. But I was falling asleep, and I got to a point where the waking world had vanished, and I hadn't started dreaming yet. And a, uh, a line came to me from a, uh, a work called Centering, which is a Hindu mystical work. And the line, I've forgotten exactly, but it's something like when the waking world has vanished and before dreams have arisen, being is revealed. So that line just popped into my mind. There was nothing else in consciousness at that point. And then that line disappeared. So there was nothing in consciousness. So I was just at the point that the line was pointing to where the waking world was gone and dreams hadn't arisen. And that was a, a moment where there was no objects in consciousness, literally no objects in consciousness. And that was my moment of waking up. So that is possible. And by the way, I highly recommend doing that kind of practice as you fall asleep at night. It's an excellent practice if you can uh, have uh, a mind that isn't distracted by what's going, you know, going over the day and then the dreams arising right away. Uh, but anyway, it does, you don't have to be in that kind of samadhi state. It doesn't matter. 
you can find in a normal, perfectly normal state like uh, Dr. Wolf was in, he wasn't in any sort of samadhi, you can find that nothingness, that, that it's a pole. It's not, a, it's not an opposite. It's not two things. That's why I call it a subjective pole. So it's a shift of attention. And the, I, I don't, I've never heard him give a more detailed description. I don't know how you could give a more detailed description. Uh, you can just point to it. And all the mystical teachings I've read, we get to this point and people can't actually tell you the mechanics of it. There is no mechanics of it. It's like quantum mechanics, totally misnamed. <laughs> In quantum mechanics, the interesting thing about quantum mechanics, there's no mechanics. It's all probability. But if you keep at, keep at it, the probability that you'll stumble on it grows, I think. I've never done a scientific test of that, but yes. I was just thinking about something that Wesley told me last night, and it reminds me of this subject. The two things, subjectivity and objectivity, seem to be like another example of duality, and that's like an illusion. So even though it's a real big deal in the history of human thought, right? Still, it's, it's really just it evaporates if you really look at it like that. It's just nothing but other, no more ideas to talk about. Uh, yes. Did it evaporate for you? Right away. Years ago. What? Years ago? What are you doing here? <laughs> it's just natural. I, just, uh, I didn't invent it or think it up. It's just my dog doesn't care about subjectivity either. <laughs> Actually, my uh, Jennifer's dog does. <laughs> but uh, no, well, again, this is, this is right word-wise, yes. Subjectivity and objectivity talking that way is just duality. Every time we open our mouths, we create duality. Unless I go, well, even if I go, ohm, I've created duality between sound and silence. So uh, even if I don't open my mouth, I create duality. If I'm thinking about, uh, you know, I'm being silent here. You know, there's a, a famous story about, uh, it's not Tsongkhapa, but one of the Buddha's original disciples. And he was once meditating on a mountain and he was deep in samadhi. And suddenly the gods started showering him with flower petals. And he opened his eyes and he says, what's this for? And they said, it's for your profound understanding of emptiness. And he said, but I wasn't thinking about emptiness. And they said, that's why we're showering you with <laughs> petals. So the key is not thinking about it and figuring out. The key is to get it. Like, <sighs> yeah. I'm kind of a little confused about the darkness. And it's almost, in a way, you're saying, what I'm understanding is you're saying kind of, be aware of the darkness, and then, then light will come. I, I, don't, I don't know. But my experience was just sitting there and waiting. Right. And there's just, there's, uh, it's light and dark, the interplay of light and dark. There's no objects or anything. It's just the interplay of light and dark. Light and dark. Uh -huh. I mean, it's not, you know, uh, various gradations. And so... I, <clears throat> okay, I, I, we're light and dark here are metaphors. You know, we're not I'm trying to be literal about uh, oh. objects. So they're using them metaphorically because we're actually trying to talk about something we can't talk about. So these mystics are using light and darkness, you know, trying to direct your attention. And really what it's trying to do is normally, you check this out to see if it's true of yourself. Normally our attention is focused on uh, the, the things, whether they're inside or outside, you know, inner sensations, my thoughts, my feelings, especially my thoughts and my feelings and how I feel about this and that and so forth. And all these uh, phenomena that arise and pass, they're all impermanent, they're all changing. You're right, it's only a play of, you know, the yin and the yang, for instance, in Taoism uh, expresses this, you know, it's all just a play of yin yang, which is light and dark symbols. And, but that's not what we're talking about here. The, what we're trying to look for is what is perceiving that play. What is not part of the play, but is conscious of the play. And that's the metaphor for what's dark as opposed to uh, the objects. 
So it's, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm having just normal experience in here, but if I start asking myself a question like, well, who or what is perceiving all this? Oh, then my attention is starting to be turned around. And there's like a lot of mystics will describe it as turning the light of attention back on itself. As Ibn Arabi said, the light, the light of the real and the light of the perceiver are manifest from the same source. And so the light of attention turns back on itself. And if it's successful, uh, you'll know it. You won't have to ask me. Yes, Liba. Um, so what I discovered is that um, the looking itself was the object of, um, anyway, it was a distraction from just being in the field and and I just kept kind of um, trying to dissolve that, but I was trying and I thought, well, who's doing the trying? Ah. And that's where I get stuck. No, you're not stuck. Who's doing the trying? Great next question to ask. Keep going. Who's doing the trying? Whatever. whatever. <laughs> no, pursue that. That's a very good question. Who's the doer? Yeah, because it just seems like a contraction in the field. Right, contraction in the field is a change, of, okay, experiential change of it's consciousness. something that's noticing that contraction. Well, who's noticing the contraction? See, once you get the knack of the, the inquiry, the question, then everything's grist for your meal. You just keep going. And whatever comes up, whatever, uh, you know, subtle, uh, something else more subtle comes, well, who's experiencing that? Keep going. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's another way of describing what I was trying to say, that, that I kept oscillating between seeking the initiator and seeking the receiver. Right. Perceiving the initiator. Right. Like both are present. <laughs> right. Well, but keep, keep going until you actually, until there's no more oscillation. When there's no more oscillation, there's a moment when there's no more oscillation and that's indescribable. And then things will start oscillating again. But <laughs> They'll oscillate in a different, I mean, you'll, they'll oscillate in exactly the same way actually, but there's a different perspe perspective if we want to put it. Uh, it's just, it'll be just different. But yes, it, this is the, uh, whatever is arising in consciousness, the, the inquiry is to whom is this arising? This is Ramana Maharshi, one of the great, great Hindu mystics of, the, of all time, but particularly the 20th century. The heart and soul of his inquiry. This, it doesn't matter what's happening, to whom is this happening? And focusing attention on that pole, on that who, the experiencer. It was exactly what uh, Dr. Wolf did. Dr. Wolf did this in a, you know, in one setting after 25 years, after always reminds you of that. And Ramana Maharshi says, with repeated inquiry, not that you're going to sit down one afternoon, you're bored and you're going to make an inquiry. Well, to whom is this occurring? Oh, boom. It actually could happen. I mean, it's possible. It doesn't usually happen. Yes. You found that when you say, to whom is this occurring? I always want to say me, yes, a person. I wonder if we change that word to what. If it works for you, do it, and then I, I'm not. I, I separate me from it and try to find something that's not a person. And, 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 in fact, I'm quoting a translation, obviously, of Ramana Maharshi. He actually said that. To whom is this occurring? And then the answer will be to me. And then you go to, to then who am I? That's the way he felt. But you can skip all that by saying, to what is this? I keep getting trapped. In. Yeah, so, so fine. What? Who or what? Or, you know, what? it's the mystery. The no thing. That's the mystery part. Yes. So is there another way of looking at darkness and light as confusion and understanding? No. That we're getting symbolic here. You know, it's already, uh, we already have to use words, but we don't want to elaborate this. In other contexts, it's... You said darkness, when, when she asked a question about darkness, I thought you said something about the darkness and light were metaphors. Or... Yes. Well, so, is there, is there another word that you, other words you can 
I, I would, I would, I think it's actually safer to talk about nothing, something and nothing. It's less, less poetic, and so it's not as attractive in a certain way, but it's also, uh, you don't, you're not tempted to elaborate on it. So here's all these things, there's something. So where is there nothing, as Anandamoyamai said? Where there is nothing, everything is for the sake of this realization. Where is there nothing? Yeah. Well, what, what Maura mentioned, that, that feeling of panic. Yeah. Seems like that's what she's alluding to. Like that, <laughs> yeah, you, that you're alluding to this, this, this right. kind of, um, that the, what, well, I that, that panic is what. Me that well. <laughs> what? Are you feeling panic? Not right now, no. What, I mean, during the exercise, were you feeling panic? No. I wouldn't say I was. Okay. I have felt it, though, when I go to bed at night. But. Ah, when you're falling asleep? Yeah. Because, and because this is a common reaction, because you're entering that moment where the waking world vanishes and dreams have not yet come. I didn't know what was happening, so I didn't panic because I, I was too dumb. But if you have some <laughs> sense of what's going on, yes, it, it will just like just like touching into emptiness. It's the same thing happening here. So it's very precious, Ellie. I want to, I want to uh, uh, try to emphasize that. Yes, it, 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 panic, uh, fear can arise and so forth, but that's a, that's a sign. That, that's where the light is, in that darkness. So if you can just let go and let yourself experience the fear, but uh, uh, surrender into it. Uh, that applies to anybody. A, a lot of people have had that experience, maybe not often, but when you're falling asleep and you're falling in deep sleep and your body's really, and there's suddenly this, you're falling into a void or a pit or something like that. And if you've had that experience, okay, there, you're touching it right in there. You're touching that nothingness. Thank you. Uh, yes? So resting in the darkness during the meditation isn't enough then one needs to pursue what the, the inquiry line. That's, is that? You, you, could, uh, you could do either one. You could pursue the inquiry or you could try to surrender. This is, this is sort of a, a, a very subtle difference between a Janana approach and a Bhakti approach. A Janana approach would be to pursue the inquiry. A Bhakti approach would be to try to rest, surrender more and more. Just, okay, allow this time, allow this time. You know, stop trying. That's, there's every, several people are stop efforting here. Just okay. And, and think of it as grace. It's worthwhile, again, it's a metaphor, but think, if, if God wants to reveal God to me now, fine. If, if God doesn't, well, it's not going to happen now. And you have nothing to do about it. You know, Brother Lawrence, a great Christian mystic, uh, he went through a period where he talked in terms of he would be in a state of grace and he'd feel all this contentment and so forth, and then he'd lose it, and he'd be, uh, uh, feel unworthy and guilty and guilt-written and all that, and he'd go back and forth between this kind of despair and this grace and this bliss and this despair, and he, his whole practice was surrendering his will to God's will. That was the, very simple. And he went through this, and then he realized he kept wanting to stay in the state of grace. But that's not surrendering his will to God's will. That's his will. And he said, the minute he, dropped, he let that go, all that vanished. And he was at peace ever since. He didn't even have the word for enlightenment. But if you read his works and the people who interviewed him stuff, you know, that's what we're talking about. He found that peace that passes all understanding. The minute he let go of trying to make it happen. So it's your choice. What do you feel called to do? What do you feel pulled to do? Now we're doing time wise here. Okay. Yes. So when you're when you're talking about there there being something real, Re yeah, real like so the world is not real, doesn't feel real. The eye doesn't rises and doesn't experience it as real. So you're kind of saying that like emptiness or nothingness is real, but it's not like a. there's anything there to be real. That's right. <laughs> that's why it's real. Everything that's there isn't real. 
in this sense. It's, it's not real. Another way of looking at this is what changes and what doesn't. Everything that is there changes, right? Isn't that your experience? Everything is constantly changing. You know, even uh, some painter, some of the, one impressionist, a Monet or somebody, once painted a cathedral in France. I don't I think it was Chartres or Notre Dame or something. And he painted it at different times of the day. Morning, noon, afternoon, evening. And so the light is completely different. And you know, you, the, the cathedral looks pretty solid. It's there, you know, you go see it, you take your picture, you walk away, you come back the next day, you take your picture, you know, it seems that, well, this is amazing because especially the, the uh, impressions, they were very uh, focused on the light, you know, shifting the color and how the light shifted color. These, you can see this the same shape, it's the same cathedral, they're totally different from morning to night. The light changes, they're totally, it's not the same experience. All of our experience, even what seems the most solid, is constantly changing. So what's real? What's not changing? What's beyond change? You could look at it that way, looking for that. That's one definition of what's real. It doesn't change. It's changeless. Yes? So we talked about openness, but... I, I kind of felt like it goes a little deeper than that because I come to realize that ultimately that there's no self. I mean, it's all, there's nothing there. There's no being there. There's nothing. There's, there's this whole thing that goes on constantly, thoughts, feelings, all of this stuff. It has nothing to do with anything. And, and so there's all that there's left is just nothing. So that's more what I was really trying to say. And I don't know if, I mean, to me, it goes beyond open awareness, but. What do you mean it goes beyond open awareness? Well, I mean, just when, I, when I'm meditating and, and doing um, awareness that's just open, accepting right. all things in. But then when I start to see all the stories I tell myself and the feelings I have and how they're all tied together into these stories and how that there's no, there's not even, there's nothing that makes me up at all. It's just all this stuff. There's no me. Right. So that's, that's more what I was trying to get at. Right. And then? So, hmm? And, and? Well? I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop here. And? <laughs> the other shoe, yeah. <laughs> I don't think the other shoe's dropped yet. OK. <laughs> Okay, so, but this is it, but this is, look, this is what we're trying to, so much of inquiry, short of, you know, trying to look directly at nothing, is, is trying to examine, watch how we create this sense of self through our stories and our conditioning and all that, and trying to recognize how that's happening. Because it's through that, first of all, that we can get some distance on all that and not take it so seriously and not be so absorbed. So just in a day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, life, if you can see yourself with members of your family, let's say, and if you can watch your mind cooking up all the stories about how, you know, this, uh, my, I don't know, sister did me wrong when I was young and I still resent that, you know, and you can see that this is a story going on, you don't have to react out of that story. Then you can, and if you're with your sister, I don't know if you have a sister, but uh, you can uh, directly respond to, what's going on in the moment without, you know, ignoring the story. And it can be much more fresh and spontaneous. So becoming free of this conditioning, just that, a, you know, today is our light of truth day. We're talking about, you know, the, the big one, you know. Uh, but uh, just a normal everyday practice at that level, it can be very valuable to do that. Now, you also might start to feel, so what's the point, Alpha, you know? There's no one here, I'm, it's all... And that happens to people. It's called a dark night of the soul or a desert experience. You know, Dr. Wolf went through a period of that where he, you know, he began, he realized that how unsubstantial everything was. And so it seemed useless. He talked about he had to actually make himself get up in the morning and, and you know, go out and, uh, uh, you know, do things. But uh, so that's not uncommon. And uh, you, if you want, I have a tape, a talk recorded called uh, what's it called? Jennifer, do you know the name of it? The dark, dark night, depression and the dark night of the soul, I think, something like that. What is it? Depression and the dark night of the soul. You might want to check that out. It might be helpful. But then there's the element, other element of it that seems to come through, which is 
a sense of love and a sense uh, of, of understanding of why, how all this comes together and to beautiful. be compassionate and loving with it. So it isn't. Oh, good. So forget what I said. You don't, don't listen to that. <laughs> no, no, no. Because, because that's what happens again. When we drop our self-centered conditioning, that natural love and compassion starts to shine. You don't have to manufacture to create it or, you know, it's just, so the attention, why? Because the attention is taken off me and what I want, everything I want and don't want and da, 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 and getting it. And, and so it naturally opens up and, oh, you know, this, so here's a need over here and here's a need over here. And, you know, the, 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 the uh, little bug is trapped in my tub. I got to take it out before I can run hot water in there, you know? It's just, it's not heroic or anything. It's just a natural response because the attention isn't on me all the time. I, me, and mine. So if you're feeling that, that's just keep going. You're, you're not doing anything wrong. You're doing everything right. Okay. So, so the other shoe still hasn't dropped. Well, you tell me. Everybody, look, everybody is their own authority. Now, in this path, I'm going to tell you a story I haven't told in a while, but my favorite story. I just mentioned it to Jennifer this morning. This is a Zen story. So this Zen monk has been studying with his teacher, revered teacher. He's been studying with him, I don't know, about five years and doing this rigorous meditation and working on a koan or whatever. And finally, he wakes up. He has satori. That's what it's called in Japanese. So he uh, asks for an interview with his teacher, and he goes to see his teacher, and he explains what happened. He describes what happened. And his teacher says, that's not satori. Go back and meditate some more. And so the monk is a little surprised by this, but he reveres his teacher, you know, and so he does, he goes away. And three days later, he comes back and asks for another interview. And he comes and he says to his teacher, if this isn't Satori, you keep your Satori, I'll keep this. <laughs> and then the, the teacher recognizes see, his. So this is for all of us. If you wake up, you don't have to go check with anybody. You know? Uh, another, uh, you could come back because there's still things to learn. After I woke up, I went to Dr. Wolf. I learned a lot from him. I went to these Tibetan teachers. I learned a lot about how meditation works. I had very little formal practice. So it's not that you shouldn't necessarily come back, but there's a story about um, Nisargadatta, another uh, great Hindu mystic of the uh, 20th century. And he, he, all he did was he had uh, satsangs. He had meetings on the top of a, this tobacco shop he owned in Calcutta or Bombay or someplace. And the top floor, people would come and first just uh, uh, Indians, but then word spread and Westerners poured in, you know. And, uh, and so he would have these overflowing crowds in this little room. And one day, and, and some of these people had been coming for years. And one day, this uh, blonde, blue-eyed German kid showed up. And uh, was listening to it, you know, and he talked, it was through a translator. And uh, the kid said, asked him a few questions, says, oh, I see, it's just everything's consciousness, right? And they talked at that, I said, oh, I see, yeah, okay, good. And then uh, it, they, it was, the exchange ended, and Nizagata was very impressed. He said, you'll be back next week, won't you? And he said, what for? <laughs> so. So don't, I, I, you don't need me to validate. It, you'll know when the other shoe drops. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I was thinking about being conscious of consciousness. Yes. And I would say, yes, definitely, that is possible. However, what I'm wondering is, when you get there, it disappears, and... Why? Is it the awareness that you've done it, or, or is it that trying to hold on to being conscious that I'm conscious that I'm conscious, you know, and then it's like gone? Uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure which, what do you mean by I'm conscious that I'm conscious? Conscious that, conscious of maybe another consciousness. Uh, I have, I, I, I just, I've never been conscious of another consciousness, so I, I can't relate to that. Anyway, it is possible, look, let me, I don't know if this is what you're getting at, but it is possible to have uh, valid, profound spiritual experiences, particularly experiences of bliss and happiness and so forth, and then become attached to them. 
And then you, you, you experience this, particularly for people who have not experienced much happiness and bliss in their life. And, you know, suddenly you realize what's possible to experience. And then people get subtly attached to that. And sometimes they think they're awake. I mean, this seems to be it. This is, you know, what I've wanted my life to feel like this all the time. And, but if they get attached to that, eventually even that is going to be impermanent. Even that is going to dissolve away. And so if you're attached to that, if the attention, everything is focused on maintaining that, then you, you're distracted from the enlightenment that produced it. And so you can, you can quote, lose your enlightenment in that sense. Uh, I would call it having a Gnostic episode and, uh, and mistaking the bliss for the realization. That's a technical way of putting it, describing it. But I would just, I, I, all I, just a warning to anybody, it's not about the experience, and the, and the experiential content of consciousness. So if you, are, if you have a, some sort of a profound insight and awakening and you're, and you're bathed in bliss, enjoy it, but don't hang on to it. it this happened to me, actually. I, I spent like three months with almost no other emotions arising, just bliss, and then it started to ebb away. And there was a moment there where I thought, oh, you know what? Oh, I, I was also because I was engaging more with people. I had been on this little pilgrimage, running around in the mountains and visiting spiritual communities. And when I started engaging more with people, I came to Denver. Actually, that was the, you know, that'll, that'll knock out your enlightenment. <laughs> but uh, it, it occurred to me, there was this moment where I could go, uh, you know, go back to the mountains and live in the mountains and live out my life in bliss. Or I could let go of the bliss and then be like completely free. Like Zorba says, we were talking about Zorba the other night, cut the rope and be free. So whatever, whatever experientially is happening, just try to avoid hanging on to it. Enjoy it completely, but try to avoid trying to maintain it. You cannot maintain impermanent states at all. Right. And maybe I can look at that a little differently. Maybe it's being conscious of a, a greater of being conscious of getting to greater consciousness. I mean, the consciousness isn't all one, like, I don't know how to put it, like all one quality or something. You've got consciousness of, you know, walking down the street, or you've got conscious of, a, of more consciousness. And, well, and being in that more consciousness, then, yeah, because you want to stay there, you, you can't. That's right. So don't, things that you can't hang on to are ultimately not pursuing with your life. They're important, you know. I, 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 you know, I'm going to have some dinner tonight because uh, I'm going to get hungry, and um, you know. So, but I'm not going to hang on to my dinner. I, I hope I'm not going to hang on to my dinner. <laughs> I'll be in trouble the next day. <laughs> no, I don't have that problem, but some people do. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is uh, this is like uh, Zen is a very good corrective to a lot of misunderstandings about what enlightenment is and and. Uh, you know, what happens. In, and there are a lot of descriptions that, you know, that it's the ultimate bliss, ultimate state of bliss and all that. And in a way, from a certain perspective, that's true. But then in Zen, they have stories like this. There's a, a little Zen priest and he lives in this little village and a magician comes to town and who performs all these tricks. He comes down by the river and, uh, you know, he's like Todd. He makes handkerchiefs disappear and he saws people in half. And then he performs this rope trick, which Todd can't do. He throws the rope up into the air and he climbs up. And as that's happening, the Zen uh, monk is walking by and the magician looks down at him and said, look at my miracles, what can you do? And the Zen priest says, uh, oh, well, my miracle is when I'm hungry, I eat. And when I'm tired, I sleep. <laughs> and so if we take the focus off all the magic and the, you know, and put it, what's, what's wrong with our life right now? Especially if, as the mystics say, Ibn Arabi talks about, every moment is a divine self-disclosure. And guess what? God never repeats himself. So this moment, and then that moment. It's never going to be. It's like the, the cathedrals. 
You could go there today and they're not going to look like Monet painted them. And you could go back every day and every day they're going to be a little different and never repeats itself. And it's not, it's not going anywhere. One isn't a greater divine self-disclosure than another moment. They're all equally divine self-disclosures. So it's all about something from a mystic's point of view that we're not seeing, but not, nothing has to change. We don't have to have greater consciousness or expanded consciousness or more consciousness or any, anything like that. We just have to see something we're not now seeing. And, and seeing is a metaphor, it's not physical seeing. So I mean, this, this is the testimony of the mystics. And so it, it's really, it, they can't tell you how to do this or what, but they can sort of, they first of all can direct their attention away from, from their point of view, uh, uh, dead end pursuits, futile pursuits, like trying to hang on to experience or trying to hang on to, uh, I don't know, attain uh, supernormal powers or all sorts of things people get involved in spiritual practices for. So that's, that's fine if you want to do that, but that's not what mystics are about. And then they can try to, you know, narrow your attention down. Okay, it's not this, it's not that, it's not this, it's not that, and ch -ch -ch -ch. but <laughs> how to dive in, how to penetrate there. I've never heard anybody could give a, a reliable, repeatable instruction, that, repeatable on uh, demand. I mean, instructions, well, like happened to me, there was this instruction when, when waking life vanishes and before dreams come, being is revealed. It's true. But I can tell you, I tell you all this, now you go home and try it tonight. It's not going to be reliably repeatable for all of you. Or if it is, wow, well, I can retire. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> yes. Um. Uh. I find that the word consciousness and even awareness, my, my mind connotates the body. So, oh, I'm conscious or I'm aware. So. But I've been fooling with the image of space. And so I'll get down to, say, bodily sensation. And now I can notice, well, there's some space that they're resting in. There's, there's space in between them. So, so then I can go into that space. And with a little luck, I can begin to see that my body and my ego are one of many in the room. I'm the room, I'm uh, the space that I try to identify with is the space in which this body and the other bodies are running around, which is uh, for me very different. No, oh, good. I mean, the space is a. Uh... Uh, also a, a fairly common metaphor, space or the skies, uh, particularly Hindu and Buddhism use space and the sky as uh, metaphors for, the, for that kind of consciousness, that limitless uh, you know, consciousness without end. Uh, the Kabbalists call it Ein Sof, limitless, without end. That has the idea of you know, infinite space. So if that works for you, great. Whatever works for you. No dogmas here. With things we discourage, like goat sacrifice and things, but <laughs> yes. A minute ago, when you mentioned the door by the creek, that uh, made me think of a request I want to make from someone to make a film clip of the dance last night that was so over the top good of door of the creek dance, right? <laughs> So I would, that's all I want to do it, and but and make it available somehow to every for everyone to look at. It. There's there's the, the publications director. This this falls under publications. Five minutes on the phone for that guy. <laughs> but yeah, you, I also wanted to mention how nice it was looking at the audience too, and just how happy everyone was. But if you could look at Ellie on the film, she would be an example of ecstatic. Experience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pass. Okay. Anyway, we got to uh, we got to bring this to a close. Anyway, so uh, we won't see you until 
officially anyway, until Sunday, September 24th. So until then, peace to you all.